so let's go to the 17th of January then, or, or the uh, sort of the hours leading up to the early morning of 17th of January. Um, you mentioned earlier how the uh, all of the different sort of environmental factors have been taken into account around when the war would kick off, the moon and the weather. Um, what's, uh, what, <laughs> what, 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 what were your thoughts then leading into the early hours of the 17th and uh, knowing you were going to be leading the first sweep into Iraq? Well, yeah. Stri striking yeah. rules and Apaches went in, but the first fighter sweep. Yeah, first fighter sweep, yeah, air-to-air uh, -air fighter sweep. Uh, we were prepared because we'd been planning it and actually practicing portions of it at night because we'd have to go out at night anyway for the desert shield uh, caps, defensive caps. And so we used those night flying opportunities to refine, refine our night tactics, which we never did at that time a lot of night flying for training. They do a lot more now, but because of that desert storm experience, but uh, it's like we were, this was something big that we were going to take an eight ship out there and fly at night. And we didn't have night vision goggles uh, or anything like it. We didn't have fighter data link. So, so we had really trained really hard on how to do it. And we felt comfortable with that. Um, and so uh, we'd already briefed the mission probably several times. So really the first night uh, we just walked in and it's like, anybody have any questions what we're going to do tonight? And it was pretty much no. The only real question was uh, our mode four IFF, our identification, uh, the, the rollover time for that, for that that day that night was 0300 and that's in other words that's when we're supposed to change to the next day's codes and it's like that's when the war started who picked that <laughs> it's like that was a bad idea and we knew there was going to be a 15 e's in front of us so we had to get the word out make sure they you let them know to roll over to their new codes on time so we don't accidentally shoot them uh but the only thing that caused concern is was when the weather dude the weather officer, I've called him weather dude, because that's the way we always called him. But that guy rolls in and he tells us we have embedded thunderstorms up to 35,000 feet. We're going, what? It's been like clear and a million miles of visibility for five months. And now we have embedded thunderstorms. And he goes, well, only, only until you get to the border and it'll be clear in Iraq. And it's like, well, our tanker's south of the border. So that was the, yeah, I, I wasn't ready for this. And that was I wouldn't say that was the scariest part of the mission, but a lot of consternation was involved in getting our pre pre uh, mission gasoline from the uh, from the uh, airborne tankers, and it, it was not an easy ride trying to get that gas, get to the tanker, and get that gas. So. Do you think that uh, I mean you mentioned earlier that the the less experienced uh, new guys you you would uh, you'd left behind. Um, was that did that sort of pay off in that sense then? I mean, if you'd had a second uh, lieutenant, sorry, yeah, yeah, of course, but... yeah, yeah, we we had a very experienced uh squadron, both from the top level, uh, and the and especially at the captain level. And, I, and what I say in a fighter squadron is the captains are the combat leaders. Mm -hmm. You might have a lieutenant colonel as a squadron commander, and he, he obviously he could lead combat missions. But it's usually the mid to higher level captains that have the most hands-on, real-time training and experience, and they should be at the front edge of that. And the other thing I did in the pre-planning is I created uh, pre-planned four ship groups. In other words, our basic lineup was four F-15s. And what I did is I handpicked who was going to be in each position of that four ship who was going to be the lead usually the number three was also very experienced and they could swap if they needed to especially if they were mission commanders and then i handpicked the wingmen and the i just tried to make sure that the experience level and the inexperience level across the four ship was fairly balanced so you might have a somewhat inexperienced wingman who was flying as number four but he had two really strong flight leads and another wingman who was like in a very experienced and maybe even a flight lead qualified guy, but he was going to fly as a wingman for the war. Cherry was that for me. Uh, he was, he was the best wingman in squadron. So I, I go, he's mine. <laughs> he's going to be my wingman. Uh, and he was really, he was really flight lead qualified. Uh, he hadn't completed his training because, because of our deployment. But, uh, um, but that's what I would do is I would, 
and we got the augmentation from the 60th squadron and we had hoser from the 59th so so in in the tactical real-time tactical operational experience at that level at the captain level we were really stacked in the mm-hmm. in the gorillas and that that was to my benefit uh, as a planner and a leader and to the benefit of the squadron so, so who's in your eight ship then so i'm the lead um Cherry Pitts is my number two, my wingman. Uh, John J.B. Kelk is my number three. And uh, Mark Willie Williams is number four. And he was he was the least experienced guy in that. He'd been with the squadron for a while, but he was a pure wingman. Um, so, uh, and then uh, Cheese Grater was the lead. Another mission commander ace uh, as the other four ship lead. I think Tonic Teal, the squadron commander, was his number three. And Scott Papama, I think was, yeah, I'm pretty sure was Cheese's wingman, number two. Once again, a strong wingman, but not a flight lead yet. And I think uh, Nips Areola, that was his call sign, so don't <laughs> nail me on that. I think he was the number four in the other. So, yeah. I. I'd have to go back and read your book to know for sure. <laughs> I should have done the same before I started this interview. Uh, what? Uh, what? So, can you can you describe then uh, what an eight ship wall of eagles does? What? What, what is that? What? What is a fighter sweep? Um, you know, uh, you've, already, you've already said it's to shoot down the bad guys, but what yeah. are you actually doing? Well, the idea behind uh, a pure fighter sweep is you have, and the idea behind this one for the way it was supposed to work it didn't necessarily go this way for the first night was that you're not tethered to any other responsibilities. So you're not trying to manage your intercept and tactics uh, to protect somebody else, which is more similar uh, with a, an OCA package or an alpha strike package, something like that. Um, and if you have a clear field of fire, it gives you your best opportunity for beyond visual range shots. And, and if anybody shows up, you're going to be able to employ, employ your F-15 at its maximum level of tactical uh, power, I guess. In other words, the idea of an eight ship all going at the same time or even just a four ship is the idea of mass firepower. And the other part of that is that we train very uh, tirelessly at executing our final lock of the target. We called it sorting to where each person can take a specific target. So you maximize how many targets you can take down in one full swoop. So that's the basic idea behind a fighter suite. Um, if, like say, as long as somebody shows up and as long as there's no friendlies in the way that aren't supposed to be there. And so that was our plan for the first night, a line abreast, uh, eight ship wall covering about 30, 40 mile swath of Iraqi airspace going going up the west side, west of Baghdad, uh, in the vicinity of uh, Mudaisis to the west, and Al Takadum and Al Assad to the east. That's that was the vector, the north vector that we were heading on, um, uh, with the intent. Yeah, we we're going to be line abreast. It didn't happen that way. Before you describe how it did happen, can can you just talk about your emotions then leading up to the mission i mean you've already said that you briefed it several times before no questions it's you know there's a thing about with the military about when people are let's you know just say scared um, you know training kicks in how did how did you feel i I felt i felt like i'm kind of on autopilot up to the point of when i strapped into the jet my crew chief was helping me and he says come back safe sir and it's like Oh uh, yeah, that's my plan. <laughs> <laughs> but I hadn't really fully really thought about it too much till then. Uh, and then right about that time, Cheese, Cheese, Greater, and his four ship, they were going to take off and go to the tanker first. And it's the middle of the night, and I see them lighting their afterburners. And we my airplane's like right next to the runway where our parking spot was. And you you just feel the vibration of the afterburners. The, you can feel it kind of in your bones and the sound. And that's when I kind of go, okay, we're going. 
and uh and so that's really when i felt it um so most of the trepidation was really getting to the tanker uh at that point and uh once we broke out in the clear at the iraqi border and we got into our formation it kind of became business as usual uh obviously it wasn't as usual but uh you you kind of fall back into your training comfort zone of you you're you're working your radar you're working your communications you're locking guys up you're identifying you're making sure somebody has responsibility for that and when that kicks in you're in your comfort zone if you're experienced and so so that was good um you know and then things happen they'll take you out of your comfort zone sometimes but uh but but that's what training's for so, so how did you get through the weather then? Uh, we we didn't until we literally got to the Iraqi border. And just like the weather guy said, it's a little bit clear in Iraq. And uh, and we were climbing at that time to get up into the 30,000s. And it, it was kind of simultaneous that as we climbed, we both climbed out of the weather up around 35,000. And, and it also ended right there, literally at the almost at the Iraqi border and out in front of it it was just pure darkness of the desert uh we'd already gotten used to looking at the stars which when there's not much surface light around you and and you're up at 35 40,000 feet and it's pitch black you can see a lot of stars <laughs> you can I mean the Milky Way was like oh my god I've never seen that before and then a shooting star would go by and just scare the crap out of you because <laughs> because they were so bright and big up at that altitude. But the other thing we noticed is um, because of the timing of the earlier strikes, all the command centers and the major cities and airfields in Iraq were just like lit up with AAA. And that I wasn't prepared. That was like, wow. I would say that's cool, but it's like, that's not cool if you're flying through that. It was, it was the, the stuff you saw on CNN didn't do it justice. What you could see from 30 or 40,000 feet with unlimited visibility. It looked like, it looked like a solid dome of tracers going up to 10, 15, 20,000 feet over the airfields and up at Baghdad and stuff. It was just like, Oh wow! How do how does anybody? And that was from a distance, so but it was like, how does anybody fly through that? How does anybody have the courage to fly through that? But you know, guys did, even though you know we lost a few jets on the first night. So, so pick up uh, pick up the the mission narrative then, Closer. Okay. So you 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 come off the tanker, you formed up into your H ship wall. So before you yeah. do that, sorry, I keep stalling you on this, but before you do that, one quick question. Sure. So, so the geometry of an eight ship wall, to me, if I put my hands up, it, it sort of suggests that to, to, if you turn now, now these guys are out of position and these guys are in front. So, 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 do you have to set your, you call it a vector? Do you have to set your your heading or your your track first and then stick to it? Yeah, that's the easiest way. The maneuvering an eight ship wall would be very difficult. So, but we we only had one way to go, and that was north. So, so once we got off the tanker and we started pushing north we we practiced how we were going to get into that formation at night and it was a much wider for, for night formation it was like about 10 miles wide for a four ship instead of like five miles wide during the day where you're looking at each other because we didn't care if we saw each other we just didn't want to hit each other so uh so and then the other four air to air attack and for that is that how uh, we you lined yeah. up uh it was basically air to air attack and uh heading management airspeed management basically same way, same day, uh, altitude deconfliction, if we did have to maneuver. And, uh, and it was for my four ship, it was literally a wall. It was line abreast. And that's what I felt most comfortable with. I think cheese's four ship. He felt a little more comfortable having his wingman slightly aft to where they could see his flight himself and number three through their radar or through their air to air interrogation. So, that was more traditional night formation, but I, I wanted everybody line abreast for that massing of firepower. And that, to me, that was easy to manage. So, okay, I interrupted you. Sorry. No, no, I was. But did I answer your question? You did. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't end up in an eight ship wall, 
And the reason for that was, uh, which I, I think you talked about in your book, and I, I talk about in mine, um, when I got my four ship finished with the tanker, I switched over to our command and control frequency. And the, the controller and the AWACS was just like almost screaming, like, I don't remember our car calling it Sitco or Pennzoil. Sitco, okay. Sitco. Uh, it's like Sitco, push now. He means head north now, start your mission now. And I'm looking at my watch going, no, we're like 15 minutes early. And I go, no, we can't do that. He goes, no, uh, the Iraqis have launched aircraft. They're in vicinity of the F-15Es. You need to go now. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, nothing goes as planned on your first combat mission. So I go, okay. And I just sit, go and Pennzoil, whoever uh, uh, Cheese's flight was that night. I go, okay, we're pushing. And Cheese is going, wait, I'm not in position. Because he'd gone farther south looking for some clear weather because we had plenty of time to get to our, our point where we were going to depart from, our push point. And so he's about, I think, 50 or 60 miles behind me. And it's like, got to go. Just, just we got to go. Just head north. You know, we'll just deal with it. And maybe that ended up being a good thing. Uh, it, it definitely changed the complexion of, of uh, what happened and the timing of the engagements. And it worked out pretty well, I think. So, you know, sometimes you just get lucky with that kind of arbitrary. Uh, this, this is not the way we planned it, but we're going anyway. <laughs> Um, so, so that's what happened. So we were not the pure eight ship wall. My four ship was out in front and I, I don't know if it was 50 or 60 miles or 30 or 40 miles, but somewhere like that. But it was, it was like a wedge formation rather than a, or an echelon formation rather than a pure wall. So what happens? So you, you, you push across the border. What do you see? Yeah. Uh, the first thing we see is we see a lot of friendly, interrogator replies from the F-15Es. Um, I, I mentioned this in my book, but, and it, it's not to throw shade at the F-15E guys, but when I planned with them and I showed them their, their, their egress route during our planning, um, I go, you guys are, you know, you guys are flying right by Mediasis Air Base when you go out and they have guys on alert there. I would highly recommend you just hit, they were hitting H2, H3 airfield complex in the Western sector of Iraq. I go, just go south to the Saudi border, get out of there and get out of our way and then head towards your base. And he convinced me they didn't have enough gas, but I, I plotted it out. I said, it's the same distance, dude. So it's like, it's their mission. I can't tell them what to do. And sure enough, we look out and right along the diocese where they're going is all the, and they're supposed to be out already so not in front of, of us. And we see all their interrogator, friendly interrogator symbol replies on our radar. It's like, oh man, this is, this is a mess. <laughs> so, um, so that was the first thing. And then we started picking up radar contacts pretty quickly uh, and locking them up and taking a look at what they are. And they're not providing friendly uh, interrogation replies. So uh, they're definitely most likely Iraqi airplanes. Um, we also had to worry about the EF-111s that were coming out because uh, they were supposed to come out low. They went in low. They're supposed to come out low. And there's a safe block uh, that we weren't going to shoot anybody below a certain altitude. So that was part of the airspace control order. Uh, but you never know what somebody's going to do in combat. And sometimes uh, we couldn't see the EF-111s uh, friendly identification replies. So we had to worry about, are they right there in front of us too? We just don't see them. And then we had F-117s, which we didn't really worry about because we're not going to see them. <laughs> so it's like, can't see those guys. So don't worry about shooting them. Uh, just make sure you know what altitude. You, we knew what altitude they were going to be at. It's like, stay out of that altitude so you don't run into one. So, so basically, we just started um, locking guys up. And usually when we'd lock them up, they'd just turn away. And so I didn't know if that was intentional awareness or they were just wandering around out there and it just happened that way. But I think three or four uh, Iraqi fighters we locked up, they just kind of turned away. You know, it's maybe they're, they're, I'm not going to go to war tonight. <laughs> I don't know what, but uh, but we did pick up 
I picked up a guy about 30 degrees to the right of my nose, maybe at around 25 or 30 miles. And I locked him up and he's down at lower altitude, like maybe 10, 12,000, but he's climbing and he's fast and he's climbing right towards us and he's not turning around. And I see this guy and I think JB Kelk probably sees him probably around the same time. And he's on JB Kelk's side of the formation. And so, you know, we have kind of areas of responsibility and you don't really want to cross those if you can help it. And, um, um, I saw, I go three, you got a target over here, you know, and basically direct him to target that guy. And he confirms he's got him. And, uh, and I'm just kind of watching it all happen. And, uh, I think he calls Fox on the radio and, uh, right about the same time, that's maybe about 12, 15 miles. Uh, we get our RWR, our radar warning receiver start going off and it's like, Ooh, this guy's locking us up. And, uh, I don't know why it was going off for a couple of us. Usually it'll just be one guy, but, um, for whatever reason, uh, we were all getting, uh, indications that we were being locked up. So. So he thinks uh, JB shoots and he closes his eyes because we we were worried about getting kind of flash blinded. And so he doesn't physically see the missile come off his jet and his armament control panel shows that nothing has come off his jet. And so we actually end up kind of defending against this, uh, what would turn out to be a fulcrum. And uh, I do remember both JB and I remember looking out and seeing a missile motor in the sky at night but you can't tell which way it's going is it coming towards us or is it going? it's just like there's something out there floating around in the black darkness and i think it's a missile but we don't know which way it's going and we we do some defensive responses uh i think i'm going to put out chaff and i accidentally hit my flare switch which these big huge mju 10s come out at night and cherry thinks i've blown up <laughs> so it's like no it's just a mistake and then we get back heading north because our radar warning receivers go go blank. And probably the scariest thing is I pick up a contact on my nose at about five miles pointing right at me. And I don't know who it is. And that was kind of like the last place I saw the fulcrum. And I go through this long effort of deciding should I shoot or not shoot. And it was painful, and I just thought I better not shoot. And it turned out it was Willie, number four. He he defended the other direction that he said that he said he was, and he was coming right at me. And I was like, oh my god, I'm glad I didn't shoot because I you know, obviously didn't couldn't confirm my ID. But he passed right underneath me. And I go, oh, it looks like F-15 cockpit lighting. So so anyway, um, we head back north, and. Uh, we continue. We didn't see a classic blow up or splash, but me and JB, we did witness what looked like almost like a sparkler, like a 4th of July little fizzy sparkler kind of falling through the sky off in the distance. And it's like, I've never seen that before, so I don't know what it is. But that's what we re reported when we got back. And uh, they were able to confirm pretty quickly the next day that he'd shot down a fulcrum. And that was the first shoot down of the war. Uh, and definitely before the Lang, in fact, cheese graders were before the, I think we, we shot down three aircraft before the CNN official <laughs> first kill of the war, the tater tate over in Langley. But we were, we were so far ahead of them on the push that all our engagements came first. And the rest of what I saw was I saw aircraft over in the Mudaisis area, which were, which was cheese's area responsibility. And I told him about those and I passed it on to him because we were flying past it by, by that time. I couldn't, I couldn't go over into his lane either and try to engage that. It's just too dangerous. So, so he picked those guys up and I think that ended up being the two aircraft he got credit for taking down that night. What's the, um, can you describe the mechanics of, of working the radar? Uh, so it's nighttime and it's dark. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, because it is at night time, yeah. um, generally dark. Yeah. Unless you're in the, really the northern northern climes <laughs> and it's the summer. There you go. Just save myself. Yeah. Um, 
the mechanics of knowing what you're looking at uh, on the radar versus what, what's on the ground. So, so, so did the radar have any symbology? Uh, I think you have little triangles maybe for steer points oh, to, to help uh, yeah, you figure out. Yeah, it's much more detailed now. Here is situational awareness. We have a situation display and you can literally put lines and symbols and all kinds of stuff on that. Uh, and that's not part of your radar scope. It's a separate display now in the F-15. And, and that that's kind of like ultimate uh, God's eye view um, essay, situational awareness of where you're at. Uh, so back then we didn't have too much. Uh, we just had, we could program a couple waypoints in our INS and they would show up as little triangles. Uh, one of those would be the bullseye. The bullseye was a reference point for communications. If, if they wanted to tell you where a guy, where a target was in relationship to a geographic or a bullseye point, whatever it was, they, we would have that point displayed or at least called up on the on the INS as our primary point. So we could recognize that. Um, what we did do, which, which I kind of learned how to do in, in the Philippines and doing large force stuff is we rec we just kind of created a geographical awareness of where we were at, uh, and understood where all the major airfields were. And we ended up using airfields as a primary reference point for situational awareness, either our position in relationship to a Iraqi airfield, or if there was targets coming from a direction, we generally reference them off a Iraqi airfield. And the AWACS guys started doing that with us too, because you kind of knew where the airfield was. So it wasn't accurate information, but you just knew over there, something's coming at us. <laughs> and, uh, or over there, my other flight member is, okay, or my other mission member or something like that. So it was not easy, uh, but it was what we were used to. So I, I wouldn't say, you know, if you put a, a, a young guy now in an old F-15C with just that VSD and no real situational awareness display uh, with with what they have nowadays, uh, it, it would be tough for them. But we, we, we had figured out ways to maintain situational awareness through our systems. Do you, do you want to take a drink or a break or anything? I'm okay. Do you no, need one? No, no, I'm good. Beer? No, no. Whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> Always. I'm I'm doing Always. dry January. Well, I'm doing I'm doing I'm trying to do three months of no boost, but um, oh, that's so, good for you. I need to do yeah. that. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so how did you feel when you when you got back? I, I mean, obviously, very few of the things that you had planned sort of went uh, to plan. Felt really good. Um, because even though all the perturbation at the beginning and things didn't go as planned, uh, surprisingly, we came out as an eight ship wall. That was kind of cool because everybody stayed, everybody was very disciplined. We had a planned flow. We had timed it out. We knew where we were supposed to be, when we were supposed to be there. And we got to the Saudi border. We're, we're still in the clear uh, above the weather. And I told everybody, uh, Sitco, Penzo, or... God, I, I don't remember Cheese's call sign, but I'll just use Penzo, Sitco, Penzo, Bright Flash, which means turn on your bright anti-collision beacons. And everybody did. And I looked out and was like, oh, my God, we're eight ship line of press. <laughs> How'd that happen? I was like, that was really cool. And we had heard, uh, we didn't know what happened with JB's, uh, JB's kill, but uh, we had heard Cheese calling Splash on his targets. And, you know, up until then, nobody had ever used the word splash in training because when we did a simulated uh, uh, takedown in training, we'd say kill, aim seven kill target at this location or whatever the descriptive was. So, um, and so he said splash is like, where did he come with that? That's like from World War II movies or something over the bullhorn splash too. But it was like so cool. And everybody goes, I'm going to use that from now on. So, so we knew, we knew cheese had taken down at least one or two. And so that was probably the most of the excitement is that first of all, we'd survived the mission. Everybody got back. Uh, we got back on the ground. Um, we, me and JB talked about his, and I, I told him, you know, and he agrees, like I, I would report that as a probable, you know, shoot down and uh he did and then we got the description of what happened on cheeses which is pretty you know pretty good the way that happened so um and and we didn't have much time for more than that because i had to my four ship had to turn 
into the next day's large force alpha package OCA mission uh, going to Baghdad. And Sly McGill was the mission commander and I was his second four ship lead on that one. So it's like, uh, get to bed guys. Cause you, we might get like three hours sleep or something like that and three or four hours sleep. And we got to get up and get ready for the next mission. So there wasn't much time to do much more celebrating than that. And that was kind of typical for the next couple of weeks. That was actually a question from, from one of the, uh, the, the guys on the 10% true, um, Facebook group. Right. You know, why, why were you flying back to back like that? Did you not okay. have the, this is I details in great detail in my book uh, of how that happened, but that was part of my that four months of planning by myself uh, in the in that little trailer. Is I recognized pretty early on we didn't have enough pilots, and uh, I told Tonic, "Hey, sir, we need more pilots." And the answer I got was always no, and and I don't think Tonic had the authority to get us more pilots because that probably went to a higher command le- command authority level. But the thing I realized and is your your peacetime manning of pilots is great for peacetime training. It doesn't really fit wartime tasking loads. So so there's something called a pilot ratio where usually a fighter squadron has for however many airplanes they have, like 18 or 24, they have 1.2 or 1.3 pilot per aircraft they have. So you have more pilots than actual aircraft, but not a lot more. And when you go into 24 hour operations, uh, there's two issues. How many airplanes do I have available? And and, uh, how much time do I have between missions to make them available? And then how many pilots do I have to fill that? And I quickly realized we didn't have enough and because we didn't have enough, I didn't have enough pilots to fulfill what I knew Riyadh wanted us to hopefully do to give them more OCA sweep or uh, escort missions um, to escort those alpha packages. Uh, so what I did to resolve that was I ta- instead of tasking on a 24-hour clock, I scheduled and tasked on an 18-hour clock. I just magically over, I fixed it. Then we had enough pilots. And so what that meant is every day a pilot would fly one mission. And it doesn't sound like a lot. Well, you only fly in one mission. Well, the way they would do it in peacetime is you, they call it surge ops. That's how you train. It's like you fly, you fly for an hour, you come back and land, they refuel you, rearm you quickly, get you back up in the air. But you can do that over a 10 or 12 hour day. You can't do that for 24 hours. You'll, you'll, you'll run out of jets or you won't have, cause you have jets are being wasted sitting on the ground, getting rearmed in gas while the guys are in the air and then other jets going in between. Anyway, I realized that that don't work. So, so I fixed that with how much time in the air we were going to use. And I recommended that to Riyadh and they go, Oh, we never thought of that. <laughs> that works. Uh, and then, and then to fix the pilot problem, uh, these were going to be long missions. So the OCA missions weren't generally too long. They were maybe two or three hours long, but the the CAP missions were six hours. And, and But that was to a benefit of the, having the airplanes available. They gave us more airplanes to fly the OCA missions. But the 18-hour thing was every 18 hours you would fly one time, whether that was a shorter mission or a longer mission. Um, and then the next day you would wake up six hours earlier because you're on an 18-hour clock rather than a 24-hour clock and fly another mission. And then the next day, you would wake up six hours earlier and fly another mission. And so your window between missions became really short. And so peacetime, you're supposed to get 12 hours uninterrupted rest and hopefully eight hours of sleep between missions. It's like, uh, maybe three to five hours, that's all you're going to get, which... No, you can deal with that. But the problem is it was always six hours earlier every day. So the circadian rhythm part of that really started to wear us down, uh, after, especially after about two or three weeks. It was like, oh, man, this is this is combat operations tempo. But uh, 
tonic and Colonel Parsons bought off on it. And they go, if that's what we got to do, that's what we got to do. And so we did it. And like I said, we were kind of the darlings of the planning cell up in Riyadh because all of a sudden we go, hey, we got a lot more missions we can do for you. <laughs> so I'm not even sure they really realized how we were doing it. They didn't care. They go, really? You can do that mission? You can do that one too and this one too? I go, yeah, we can do all of those. Uh, as long as we're the mission commander, we'll we'll do it. And uh, <laughs> kind of strong armed. And uh, they go, yeah, you got it. So uh, so that yeah, so that's why when I was saying, hey, we only got three or four hours to get some sleep, that was pretty typical for long stretches of time. Yeah, that's why we had a flight doctor and we had really good drugs. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's how uh, Coma Pal. That's how he got his call sign, wasn't it? Um, it could have been. He was taking the wrong pill. He was taking the sleep pill instead of the go it pill. This yeah. is on his the, the flight across. I had I had no. I grew up in the seventies. I had no problem taking drugs, and I knew which <laughs> pill it was. So. But I, I I tell people uh, Corey Cornum. He was Rhonda Cornum's. Rhonda Cornum was pretty famous. She wrote a book. She was the she got the flight surgeon got captured by the Iraqis. Um, he was our flight doc, and I, I credit him with saving lives and making us mission effective because he would make sure that we had something if we needed it, you know, just take it if you need it. But but we had go pills, basically amphetamine. And uh, if you needed it to be alert in combat, you took it. And when you got back, you took a no-go pill uh, to put you, get you to, because you needed that sleep. You needed that three, four, five hour sleep. You couldn't wait around waiting for the go pill to wear off so um i'm sure he saved some lives in airplanes doing that she she was a black hawk pilot is that she was a black hawk uh, army black hawk uh flight surgeon flight surgeon medical yeah but she was on a rescue mission when her black hawk got shot down and that's that's quite a story and Corey was her husband and he was our flight doc so he we heard about that and he found out about it and we didn't know what happened to her and that was rough very rough but he car- he carried on in the squadron. He didn't. Sort yeah. Of, uh, wow. No, he was a pro. Wow. A little pro. But everything it's... worked out good, you know. Other than she had to go through that ordeal. So. Yeah. So the first day mission then. Yeah, first day mission um, was a alpha package going up to Baghdad. I can't remember the exact number of F sixteens, but I think it was kind of two squadrons worth, so maybe 30, uh, 20, 24, 30, 30, I don't know. It was a lot. And all the uh, all the support assets that I talked about there. And then this is one of those missions that got added on that we took the lead on. And uh, Sly, I made Sly the mission commander. I was there with him. So he's he was not our, he was our probably our least experienced mission commander uh, from the aspect of flying those kind of missions in the Eagle community and stuff. So I was kind of there to, to be there to help them with any planning, but it was a solid plan, eight ship wall going North. And, uh, um, and I just felt really bad for the lonely, two lonely big 29s that were airborne that day. And I don't, if they knew the behemoth that was coming at them, they were probably the bravest pilots in the air. It was just this massive armada of Air Force weaponry coming at him. And uh, and Sly and Hoser Drager dispatched the two MiG twenty nines that day. What what do you um I mean, what do you think about the performance then of the Iraqi Air Force on balance? I mean, obviously later on in the war and, and it, the shooting war wasn't more than a few weeks, was it? Three or four weeks or so. I mean, but they, well, they so they, they sort of left for Iran, didn't they? But there were some brave Iraqi pilots. Um, I, I assume that you you strap on a fighter jet in combat, you're a brave pilot. Doesn't matter what the outcome is. That you gotta be brave to strap on a fighter, no matter what country or what reason you're fighting. And you know, fighter pilots, we just like most combat units, you you're fighting with each other and for each other. So you're you're fighting for your wingmen, your flight members, your you know your mission to be successful. So uh, they were not as well trained as us. I can guarantee that. Uh, um, I think we discovered that we didn't know that the Foxbat pilots turned out obviously to be the best. 
they are most capable of trying to utilize their weapon system the best way they could with some success, at least, uh, either surviving or surviving longer or actually taking down at least one uh, uh, U.S. aircraft we know of. Um, they, they, we, that Desert Storm Force was built, I call it, in my book, I call it Mr. Reagan's Air Force. Ronald Reagan, it probably started a little bit before him after Vietnam, but, you know, we came out of Vietnam kind of licking our wounds. Love. Uh, we didn't do that good, you know, and that was the impetus for the fighter weapon school and, and stuff like that. But both from a uh, plus up in force structure and then a plus up in fourth generation technology, uh, that force that fought in Desert Storm was really designed to take on the Soviet Union. So that's what the Iraqis were fighting on a massive scale. Like I told you, even some of our own Air Force guys were like almost dumbfounded and in awe of the scale of the first three days of the war, of what we were going to put up in the air. They they had they really had no ability to, you know, to counter us in an air war. It was just a matter of do you want to come out and fight or or not. But yeah, go ahead with your question. Yeah, no, I was, uh, I mean, I, I, sh I really should have read uh, my book before before I started this, because I'm trying to... Oh, you've written so many. I've only to, written hard, so... <laughs> yours is probably better than all of mine combined. Well, there, so. person, so. <laughs> but but I, I'm trying to sort of remember, I, I know that certainly, you know, the RC-135 was able to pick up some comms uh, between the Iraqi ground control uh, intercept stations and the and the MiG twenty nines and and certainly the Mirage F ones and I know that some you know it was those Iraqi pilots knew what was coming in some instances I know there are some kills where you know they they're, they're told this is what's coming your way and they they stick at it anyway uh, how much sort of insight like that did you get at the time um, in terms of uh, you know what uh, well sometimes we would get. Uh, platform identifications from the command and control assets. And I'm not privy to all the ways they can get that. I do know, and most of it's, if, it, if I know how it's classified secret or higher anyway, so I wouldn't be able to tell you. But, you know, it's it's fairly well known that there's ways to intercept uh, signals or communications or or whatever like that. We generally were not privy to that other than if, somebody identified a target as a certain type of aircraft, they would try to pass us that information verbally through communications. It would get to the AWACS controller. And we had that several times where they say, hey, this is what's out there. And, and sometimes they were wrong. It's like, no, that's not a fulcrum. That's a fox bat uh, <laughs> when you get to the merge. But um, yeah, so we had awareness uh, of uh, things going on, but not at the level that the command and control assets have. And and the we would probably end up getting back to the intelligence side. Maybe as the war went along, we we tended to get feedback on a little bit more of what was going on. But most of we just it's what we saw. In other words, did, what what did we see? Did it surprise us? Uh, is it something we expected? Um, how did we perform? How did our missiles perform? How did our unit flight perform? And it was more we were more about how how we performed than how the Iraqis were going to do. Because we knew if we did what we were supposed to do, we should come out on top. And but once again, they were they were facing something they were never trained to face. So you said uh, you know you if they'd known you, you felt sorry for them if, if they'd known what was coming their way. Um I think they were brave if they knew <laughs> they were brave. But yeah. was there any part of you you know that that sort of asymmetric element of warfare, where you know you're so dominant in terms of numbers, in terms of capabilities, in terms of training, as a human being, as a person, was there any part of you that felt a bit sorry for them? Uh, you, I, I deal with that a lot in my book. So, um, and I know other pilots have also, but usually it's not at the moment. Like, oh, I still, I'm not going to shoot this missile. I feel sorry for the guy, you know, unless he was in a parachute or something. Uh, but normally it's the aftermath of combat and the results of combat that you have to deal with. And that's universal. Uh, and it's 
pretty well documented um, um, through, uh, you know, ground wars mostly. But even in the air, um, you come back and you realize, um, you know, we, we call them MIGs. We, we refer to them as targets. Uh, we say kill, but we don't really think of the word kill until maybe it actually happens. And then you kind of realize, uh, you know, there's another human being in that airplane. And that's something you have to deal with both at real time and then later in your life. And uh, yeah, that's that's war. So uh, everybody deals with it in their own way. My book pretty much outlines how I've dealt with it in my life. So um, but yeah, but at the time you, you're doing your job, uh, there's, there's no hesitation in doing your job and, and your training really kicks in at that point. Let's, let's talk about your kill then. Can you, okay. can you talk us through it? Uh, yeah, I'll give you the, the, the brief version of it. Uh, but, um, it really started, it's one of those, Hey, this might not have happened if something else didn't happen kind of stories, because. What had really gone on is earlier in that day, uh, we were on another big mission to Baghdad and JB, uh, our foreship was the mission commander foreship and JB was, it was his term to be the mission commander. So he was on that great, had a great plan, had all the airplanes there. Uh, everybody's checked in, everybody's got gas, we're ready to go on time. And they say, stand by and we stay standing by, standing by, standing by. And then they go, missions canceled. And I, I think they might have told us weather in the target area or something, but these were daytime F-16s dropping dumb bombs, Mark 82s, you know, like it's, they're basically modern B-17s. They need to see the target, you know, <laughs> to hit it. So, um, so they canceled the mission, but there was something else going on that we found out about later is that that morning they'd shot the first scuds at Israel from Iraq. And so I think that set off a lot of alarm bells. And I, I don't know if that's why they canceled the mission or if it really was the weather or some of the both, but, um, but it was over. So JB unfortunately didn't get to lead his mission. And uh, um, we left or left. Uh, there was another part of that. <laughs> so we thought something else was going to happen, but I'll leave that for the book. Um, we went, we got back to the base and it was like, Oh man, we get to get some extra sleep because we, our mission ended early. So you know, like, let's go get some food and uh, let's get a pancake and get some sleep. So, uh, but I was in, I think we were just getting ready to leave the operations Intel room and somebody goes, so you got a call from Riyadh and uh, I pick it up and it's an old friend of mine from Kadena. It's uh, Rich McSpadden and he was working in the planning cell and he goes, so can you give us a four ship to go airborne? And they want, we want you to cap for some, we're going to put some guys looking for scuds out in Western Iraq, uh, kind of keep the Israelis out of the war. So we'll, we'll go hunt scuds for them. And it's like, I don't, everybody's tasked already. I mean, we were maxed out on Tasky, and then I kind of look around. It's like, uh, I guess my four ship could do it. <laughs> I didn't know if the, if the maintenance could turn the, turn the jets around and get them refueled in time. But I talked to the maintenance guys. They go, yeah, they'll be ready in an hour. I go, I told him, Spad, we can be up there in about an hour and a half. He goes, okay, you got it. And literally, we just got something to eat. And as they say, you kick the tires and light the fires. And we were airborne. And our plan was just to sit over in the H2, H3 area of Iraq, wait for the strikers to come up. And we we're just going to orbit for them to protect them, basically a cap, a defensive cap, make sure they didn't get jumped by any Iraqi fighters. And so I expected to be a pretty mundane and uneventful mission. And then a true Navy alpha strike was going by us going north. I think they were going to hit Al-Assad or, yeah. And uh, AWACS told us, and they were coming right through the area we were in. So we just got out of their way because we didn't want them shooting at us by accident. <laughs> and I said, hey, let us know when they're on the way out. And, uh, and they did. And they said, yeah, Navy package is coming out. And then they go, hey, we got bandits airborne. They're chasing the Navy guys. And I had a mission to do. Uh, I go, okay, just let us know if you need us to commit. And like right away, they come back. They go, yep, commit north. They gave us the direction. And the, and so we basically light their lighter burners and we just start smoking almost due east um, to kind of cut off the 
Iraqi fighters that were trying to chase down the tail end of the uh, of the Navy package. And Disco told me a great story. Disco Doug Dildy. He said he'd talked to the couple of the Navy guys on the package, and they said they were never so happy to hear Air Force Eagles on the way, <laughs> so because <laughs> they had nobody protecting the tail end of the package, and then literally they were getting like threat ten miles threat eight miles threat five miles threat six miles and the guys go whoa they just thought they were going to get picked off and uh we locked up a couple guys a couple of iraqi fighters and sure enough as soon as we locked them off they broke off and turned northeast towards baghdad and it's like okay we did our job and as soon as they did that they go more more bandits airborne and they were north for about 40 or 50 miles um and so we basically checked to, towards north and we had to watch the other guys that had just broke off the attack because they were close enough. If they turned back towards us, they were going to be a threat. So so we're kind of keeping one eye out to the northeast with our radar. I told Jerry to watch those guys. He was on the east side of the formation, one and two on the east, JB and Willie. I was the leader now, uh, JB and Willie, uh, three and four on the west uh, side heading north. And sure enough, we lock up uh, a couple targets north of us and uh, they're down low and they're going really fast. But when we lock them up, they do the same thing. They kind of turn away. Um, and we just thought, ah, we've seen this before. You know, it happened on night one. Everybody's everybody's going to go home. They don't want to fight today. But sure enough, uh, they didn't turn away for very long, the second group, and they turned back south and then they just kept coming. And they're going, like I said, really fast. And... Uh, um down low which was a little bit unusual but the geometry of what i was seeing with the two fighters kind of going out to the northeast and two guys coming at us was very classic iraqi tactics a decoy tactic so their expectation like they had done with the iranians that we've been briefed on is that we would follow the first two fighters towards baghdad and then the next two fighters would come around our left side and outflank us and basically get us from the stern. Uh, and that's what they would used to do to Iranians. Uh, but we'd been trained against those kind of tactics by our aggressors and other, our own training, excuse me. And uh, we recognize it. So I just basically checked the flight north into the other two guys and me and JB lock up those targets. They're in a lead trail, about a three to five mile lead trail. Uh, coming straight at us and literally just as we're about ready to, and my idea was let's take our aim seven shots, take these guys out beyond visual range BVR before the other guys come back and let's get out of this fight, go home. And, uh, and literally just as we're both getting ready to shoot the Iraqi, uh, which I did find out they were called out as MiG 29s. And then we would soon find out, no, they're Fox bats. Uh, right about the time we we're going to shoot, they go into this, beam maneuver they turn 90 degrees to us which could either be a maneuver or it could be a defensive uh re reaction because it's kind of a classic way to defeat a radar is to put yourself in the ground clutter of a look down pulse doppler radar which uh if you do it right can be effective and and it's well known <laughs> it's not a, but we were surprised that either these guys were really lucky and they just happened to turn at the right time or they really knew what they were doing and we found out later they really knew what they were doing. And uh, and what happened there is both our radars, mine and JB's radars, broke lock. And it's like, Oop. but we knew what to do. You just be patient. And then, then I told Cherry to come down and look low with me. And when they came out of, out of that beam maneuver, we found them in, in a short range on our nose. We both locked up. I locked up the leader. He locked up the trailer. Uh, but we were just too close, too tight, and we were still really at high, higher altitude, and we couldn't get a shot in the face. And so um, we got to emerge. The leader was smoking fast. I looked down, and I go, Ooh, there he is. And he was just so fast going by me. I go, I'm never going to catch that guy. So I just let him go because the next thing I heard is Cherry's engaged. He calls engaged because the second guy is in a turn right underneath us. I think he knew we were there, but he didn't know where we were because we were so high. So I assume his controller probably told him you're merged. And he just started turning, probably looking for us. And he probably never saw us until Cherry started shooting. And so what happened is Cherry does this high 
over G's the jet, uh, split S, and I just kind of flow to the other side, his right side, and I do more of a slicing turn. And he's the engaged fighter. I'm the supporting fighter now. And he's camped behind this fox bat. And Cherry's just, I tell Cherry, he's like, dude, you look like a Roman candle because he's just firing missiles. Fox, seven, you know, Fox 2 or Fox 1, Fox 2. Fox. And the fox bat is just putting out chaff, flares, chaff, flares. And it's like, I don't think Cherry's ever going to kill this guy. And so I call him off, but he doesn't hear it because he claims. But no, I... I <laughs> He actually is calling one of his shots. I, I reviewed the tape. It's right at the same time I say that he's keying his mic and calling his what would be his last shot. So he's shooting uh, one more aim seven. I'm shooting an aim nine. His aim seven gets there somewhere in there. He sees his guy eject. I never saw that from the distance and the angle I was at, but he saw it because he said that he almost hit the guy coming over his canopy. But uh, we fly. I've, Cherry comes off left, I, I believe, and I fly right past the fox bat. And I was thinking he was still fighting, still alive, but I and I was going to just use my gun. But um, his burner cans were dark now. His engines were off, whether he'd shut them off or Cherry's missile had taken out his engines or something. We didn't see any big explosion or smoke or anything. So it, it looked like he was still flying. But um, so I, I knew he was done and his airplane was just sinking into the undercast at about 2000 feet and like a ship sinking. And so I come around the corner, uh, and my auto lock mode snags the other Fox bat who'd gone out maybe eight, 10 miles and finally got his airplane turned around. He was going so fast and he's like right on my nose. My radar locks him up automatically. Cherry tells me about him. Hey, Lee, you got one on your nose. I go, yep, I can see him. <laughs> and, uh, and I basically, roll in right behind them. And I think I over G my jet too. So, so I always tell guys, you know, the Fox bat, he's down low, he's going fast. He can probably only do about two or three G's in a turn. Uh, and me and Cherry are performing at nine plus G's in our turns. And it's like, if the guy saw us, he must have just gone, Oh my God, how, <laughs> how do you get his jet turned around so fast? And I end up right at his six o'clock, just like Cherry was on his guy, but I couldn't tell what he was. Even at that range, I was within a mile, less than a mile and a half, almost a mile. Because I could tell what kind of plane he looked like kind of, but it was a twin tail airplane and so, so is an Eagle. Uh, so is a Tomcat, which there was just a Navy package there recently. And I didn't know where JB and Willie, uh, my number three and four went at that time. So I, I just really didn't know what he was for sure. And so, if you ever hear the comm, which I think they played on CNN from Riyadh, like a couple days later, it's like, Clouseau, oh, your, your comm, your HUD tapes on the CNN. <laughs> it's, it's like, wow. Uh, they had to, they had to add a lot of, a lot of it out for security reasons. But uh, that's where I kind of go through this uh, iteration of asking guys if anybody's in burner, because this airplane has got two huge burner plumes coming out the back. And that probably wasn't going to be enough for me to be, Sure, but I could start using visual identification clues like how many uh, missile pylons he had on his wing and things like that. And I go, that's not an eagle and that's not a tomcat. That's got it. That's the fox bat that I saw at the initial merge. And that's when I started shooting. And so. Um, yeah, because you, you had said uh, everybody out of burner now. Yeah, yeah. Just to, like I wanted to see if this guy's burners went out. But looking back, it's like, well, I can't make sure that everybody got my call. So it was really, it ended up being a visual identification. So the, I was trying to use Calm to verify just to be sure. But by the time I went through that whole iteration, I I confirmed in my mind this was a fox bat that was in front of me. But it surprised me it, it was so hard to do even at that close range. So, uh, so I started shooting, had a few problems with a couple missiles. And once again, we'd seen good defensive responses out of the Fox bats, which were giving our missiles a hard time with chaff and flares. Uh, so it was really my second aim set. My first aim seven shot, the missile motor never fired, which would turned out to be kind of a common problem during Desert Storm. Um, but the second one did. And at that close range, it got to him pretty quickly. 
And I, it, it was, there was some temporal distortion there. I just thought he, why didn't he blow up? But, um, but the missile got there and it, I think it might've been a contact fuse actually, but, uh, it seemed like forever from the time my missile arrived, but when he blew up, it wasn't like Cherry's airplane. I mean, he, his jet literally disintegrated. Um, and that was, you can hear me yelling, screaming, splash on the radio. And then the next thing comes up my mouth is where are you guys? Cause I was all alone. <laughs> so. I was like, you don't want to be all alone in combat because I told Cherry leave, you know, while I finish this guy off. But uh, he did. And he was about nine, 10 miles away from me when I got turned back around. So so uh, that's that's another part of the story. But that's that's basically the way it happened. Two, three, four, one, two, one, zero. We're at East five. Bingo. Fuel. Five. Bingo. Fuel. Bingo fuel. Bingo fuel. Yeah, is anybody in burners? No, I'm firm. Everybody out of burner. Reach. Six, five miles. Right, Paul, let's push it up. Come back. Thank you. Threat, southeast five. This is a question we've sort of covered it, but I'll ask it explicitly anyway. But what were your immediate feelings then, other than feeling all alone? What were your immediate feelings uh, uh, having shot this guy down? Uh, I um, it, like in the air in the cockpit. It was the way it blew up. Was like, oh wow! That was like I just didn't expect that, based on what I'd already seen from the previous. Uh, uh targets we'd shot down um it was it was uh i would say I, I can't say it was elation because i was still in a combat zone but it was like all right great you know that's that's the result i wanted let's get the hell out of here and and so everything that happened after that was trying to get us home safely and there was a lot to that part of the story too um and then probably the celebration elation part really ended up being when we got on the ground uh first of all we did our victory rolls over the airfield <laughs> which were kind of illegal but we got away with them anyway uh <laughs> not not we had not tacit approval from the wing commander from colonel parsons but when sly and poser did it on their first mission he didn't he didn't ground them. So they survived. It's like, okay, we can do it too. So, um, but me and Cherry, we parked in the same area and we got on the ground and we were just hugging each other and talking about what had happened and, and things like that. You, you mentioned the motor no fire. Um, that seemed to have been a recurring theme. Um, did it dent your confidence in the, in the AIM-7? Uh, we didn't have uh, much problem with it. Um, that was one of the few cases I think that we had a problem. Uh, I think it was Bitburg had a big problem with it. And they, it was after the war, they finally figured out why. Uh, and it was because uh, the cart, which is the uh, cartridge, the explosive cartridge that when you hit the, the pickle button, the fire button, and it gets the signal to fire, it basically, um, and they, at that time, we just carried them on the, fuselage station so so that cartridge would fire and that that explosive impulse would push the feet of the uh ejector system for the aim seven so it literally pushed unlocked and pushed the airplane or the missile away from the airplane um that had to occur over a very specific time a very you know we're talking microseconds or you know less than a second or something but uh because uh, they didn't want a, the motor to fire while the while the missile was still attached to the airplane, and so it had to push the missile away at a certain speed or rate that 
it would know that the missile's away from the airplane. And then they had an umbilical that once the umbilical broke, it knows, okay, the missile's separate from the airplane motor, you can fire. So it was basically a motor safety mechanism. Well, they, were, they had some carts apparently that were bad, the lot, whoever the manufacturer was. Um, and when we would, and nobody knew this, but we'd fly so many hours at high altitude that these things would get cold soaked. And so when they got cold soaked, they would fire usually, but they fired at a slower rate than they were supposed to. So the missile would release from the jet, it would get pushed away, but at the time the motor was supposed to fire, it did not break the safety umbilical yet. And so the jet thinks, oh, your missile's still on your airplane, and so the motor's not gonna fire. And that's that's what we found out was the cause. And, it, and apparently Bitburg had most of those bad bad carts, and so they, they had a big problem with that. Now, did, now they know. Now they know. <laughs> so, yeah. How, how did the the rest of the the war go for you then? What was? Uh, uh, well, how would you, you talked about uh, air superiority. Um, I judge we gained air superiority that day. Um, that was the. It was day three of the war. Um, we shot down the two fox bats simultaneously. Uh, Rico Rodriguez and Mole Underhill were shooting down two fulcrums in the vicinity, same vicinity. We'd already, I don't know if they were the two fulcrums we saw originally. Or I think there were two fulcrums, somebody else. Uh, I see an F1 fly by me on the way out, which I decide bravely to not engage because me and Cherry are really low on gas. Uh, so there were a lot of Iraqi airplanes in the sky on the 19th. And so what, what I told everybody that day is that's the day the Iraqis came out to fight on the 19th. And they lost some of their top line pilots that day. And then what I found out later from uh, Tom Cooper and Doug Dildy in their book and what they were able to find out is actually they came out that day to specifically try to trap an eagle and shoot it down. That was their goal. And so what we did see, we saw a tactic and not just one tactic, but multiple aircraft involved in separate launches and different tactics at the same time. And that was their best shot. That was the first time they put up multiple airplanes against any of us. And, and the fact that there was only four of us out there, well, plus the, the two ship, uh, Rico and, and Mole, uh, but they were on a DCA cap mission. They got pushed north, uh, is they didn't have to deal with a big package of f-15 fighters they just had f-15s and uh, they lost that one they lost that day and what we saw immediately after that is they stood down uh we didn't see for the next week week and a half we didn't see anything flying i mean we would occasionally there'd be something airborne but nobody came out to engage us after that and so i, I did an interview with uh history channel a while back and it's called defending japan and uh and we were talking about air superiority of that idea of air superiority and every everybody puts the idea on on you know the level of your technology and uh the uh, the level you know how many airplanes you have and stuff like that but but the iraqis had a lot of airplanes I know the exact number, but, you know, frontline fighters, they probably, you know, had 150, 200 frontline fighters. Uh, they had experienced pilots, trained pilots. Uh, but after three days of the war, I'm pretty sure they saw that their efforts, they, and on the third day when they brought their best pilots and their best tactic they can came, come up with, and they got beat down pretty hard, uh, they stood down. And so air superiority doesn't have to be over technology or numbers, but sometimes I think, you know, if you can get into the, the psyche of, and once again, yeah, I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> uh, once again, um, you know, they're brave to come out and fight, but some, at somewhere in their command level, I think somebody decided, okay, nope, we're either going to figure out a better way or we're just going to try to preserve our air force for another day, another war, another fight. 
So they pretty much stood down and didn't really challenge us at that point. So, so air superiority is, I think, is what you achieve it when you get to that point where the airport air, the other guys either don't have the ability to fight or maybe just go, oh, no, nope, no, nope, we're not going to, we're not going to challenge you anymore. Now you've achieved air superiority and that's, you don't want to be on the losing end of that. So, so from that point, we only saw guys usually trying to run away. And so the, basically all our, all our, uh, shoot downs after that engagements and shoot downs were pretty much guys not trying to engage us, but just trying to get away from one airfield to another, or from, you know, Iraq into Iran or Syria is what we saw. And we, we caught some of those guys and shot them down, but, but there was no, no face-to-face -face fighting really pretty much from that point on from the 19th on as, as a as a weapons officer then did you come away well i suppose as a community um did you did you come away with some learning points for you know for future combat was there anything that you had done that you would need to do differently next time oh well you should do stuff differently next time because if you do stuff the same it's not necessarily going to work. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's a, always been a lesson is you always have to be improving and changing. Uh, not sure the air force <laughs> totally realized that or realizes it still, but, um, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a lesson of war. It's you, you have to always be improving, not just your technology, but your experience and your, tactics and always coming up with new ways because the enemy figures it out. The other thing that I came out of that with, I learned a lot of lessons, like just like what I talked to you about manning and how many combat sorties you can support the best way to task those combat sorties. And I was, I was, I passed that information along and I was really happy the air force kind of ran with that. And it wasn't just because of me, but the, the Riyadh planning guys brought that experience back. And so that, that kind of changed the way we would kind of fight a 24 hour war. Uh, but it, it really validated the training that we had done up to that point that people performed the way they expected them to. Um, I did learn, and I had this kind of validated through uh, a book that I read not too long ago. It's called on killing. Have you read that book? Uh, I can maybe Amazon search it right now. Cause it's at work. I have my copy at work and I can't remember the name of the author, but it's about the psychology of killing in war. And I had an interest in that kind of, as we alluded to and how people deal with that, but it gives you a historical perspective and stuff. And even from a training point of view, and I, I've passed this along to the community and too, but you never know how somebody's going to behave in combat until you're actually in combat. And that surprised me a little bit. And once again, just to strap on uh, a fighter, a modern fighter and take it into combat, you've done a lot to get there and you're brave enough to do that. But not everybody's going to fight at the same level of intensity. And the difference being is because um, and this was very common in, in like World War II and stuff. First of all, people sometimes wouldn't even fire their gun just to overcome that training of that, you know, buck fever and, and uh, being able to just fire your weapon, a missile or the gun the first time is a major effort to get people to that point. Um, and then the second part of that is, is wars are big, complex things and there's plenty of area and space and time to either be in the fight or be on the edge of the fight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you can still be participating, but you can be kind of participating from the edge rather than in the fight. And so the difference for a unit, and I think once again, if you want to go back to that, uh, was there a difference between the units? And I, I can't quantify this or say there was a big difference. Uh, but what I do recognize is, the more guys you have in the unit, and we had a lot of them in the guerrillas in the 58, that are, have that kind of warrior mentality, and the and they're going to make an effort to engage uh, the enemy in combat, even if it's close in engagement, they will bring other people along with them. 
and there'll always be a few stragglers maybe they're just kind of hanging on the fringe but they won't influence the overall outcome of that unit and their success but if you don't have a preponderance of that then you know maybe i don't have to you know go north <laughs> right now <laughs> you know maybe i can wait five minutes uh you know there's a lot of self you know moderating performance in combat and so so once again i think that goes back to training it goes back to the uh maybe esprit within the unit it goes back to the experience level but i'm sure that's true in every other type of combat unit uh throughout history and through other other you know services and stuff like that that you see that kind of thing and, and that kind of surprised me and what the good part was is i realized how important that was because i was still a weapons officer when i finished and i actually went back to kadena to be a weapons officer again in the dirty dozen the 12th squadron again and i i it totally changed my outlook on how do i get guys prepared for combat because i had to pair, prepare them not only for the technical skill aspect of combat i had to try to prepare them for the psychological aspect of combat and to make sure they were going to be that ultimate contributor not just a participant that's a unique experience and that's uh that's something you only get through that process of being in combat and being able to pass that along and and elevate other people the best you can up to that level but like I say, I tell guys like, you're not, you're not going to know. You might be able to look at somebody and go, yeah, he'll, you know, like just look around your squadron. Who are your warriors? You probably know a handful of them, but some guys will surprise you and step up and other guys that you think might step up, they might not. That's the psychology of combat. You think that you know, briefly, is, is that a, that's a self-preservation thing or, or you think that's, oh, yeah. um, so it's not not to do with sort of, you know, could I take the life of another? It's to do with I don't want to lose uh, my life. Well, I, I I'm sure it would be a complex, and I I don't think it's even a maybe a conscious thing, because you know you find yourself, you know that, you know you're in the airplane to begin with. You've chosen this profession, so, um, it's I think it's it's human, uh, it's the human condition. It's, uh, yeah, first of all, and back to that book on killing is, unless you're a psychopath, you're not programmed to kill. But also we've been trained not to necessarily humanize our targets either. That's the essential part of how training changed from World War II to modern training. So when we say the moniker in the Air Force is kill MiGs, well, a MiG is an inanimate object. It's an airplane. It's a fighter airplane. Okay, so and then in training, you know, uh, you're going and let's say how they train in the army or something like even in simulations, you understand that this is a simulation. So your target might have a human form, but it's not an actual, you know, target because uh, you have to overcome that natural. Uh, I, if you haven't read that book, I, I highly recommend you read it. Um, and uh, I, I put it for my book. I put it on a recommended reading list is yeah you have to overcome that and then you know afterwards uh um you have to deal with the aftermath and then realize it's kind of a moving target too because you know your ultimate goal as a fighter pilot is to shoot down another aircraft you know is that the same goal you're going to have on day two after you already shot down an aircraft or is that change it might change because you achieved your goal so now it's like being well i'm going to Make sure I get home <laughs> or maybe you're dealing with the aftermath of that first one. And, uh, and, and, and so once again, you know, you're, you're in a service to your country. You, you know, you have a job to do. And I, I think, you know, people do that and they will continue to do that, but it doesn't mean they don't have this psychological aspect of it that they have to deal with, whether it's real time in combat or the aftermath of it. So how did you how did you wrap up your career? Uh, well, going back to Gadina was great. That was the dirty dozen. That's where I started. That's where I owed everything. Um, I was going to get out 
actually after that. I kind of started becoming disillusioned a little bit with the Air Force. Um, and I, ref I, I go through this whole process in my book. So, um, and not the individual and not necessarily in the institution as a whole, but there, there used to be kind of a saying among fighter pilots, like we had to put up a lot of BS, a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff you have to do that's not related to flying and you, you always, or, you know, leadership issues or why are we doing this and stuff like that. And you just dealt with it because you got to fly jets. Um, but everybody say, well, after we go to war, that'll all change. And it's like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> so it's still there when you get back. And there's another great book. Uh, I think the author is Drury. I read, I read it when I was on my first assignment at Kadena. It's called My Secret War. And it was written by a guy who was an A1 uh, Sky Raider, Sandy pilot in Vietnam. Great book. Highly recommended. And it's that here's what, you know, and if it's not a jet fighter, but that those guys were crazy. Those, those Sandy drivers like this stuff they would do. Uh, but it's that psychology of being in combat. And go back to the psychology of being in combat. Um, my very first squadron commander here at Kadena, his name was Hawk Taylor. And he was, he was leaving the squadron. Another guy, OPEC Hess, who I talk about in my book as a big influence on me, he was taken over, but at Hawk Taylor's going away party, he got up and he, he maybe had a few drinks and, and he, he was telling us a story and he was, he was old enough that he'd be in Vietnam. And I'm not even sure what he did in Vietnam, but it was within combat operations and stuff and um, flying wise. And he was telling stories about that. And he said, you know what I found is being in, I loved it. I loved being in combat. But he kind of ended with, that's not necessarily a good thing, <laughs> you know? And I felt that too, uh, from that day after my shoot down, once I kind of dealt with the immediate of that, it was like, man, I got a job to do and you can ask Cherry, but we were, we were out there looking for stuff. We were looking for trouble. We didn't, we wasn't like we were satisfied with our aerial victory. Let's just get through the, we were, we were, we were out there on search and destroy missions <laughs> for, for Iraqi aircraft, anything even shooting guys straight from the airfields. So uh, I think we alluded to that earlier. Like, I, you're going to let me straight this airfield? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just to touch you really quickly, have you, have you put the strafing in your book? It is in the book. It's a okay, great story. Right. I, I won't ask uh, you to talk about it. Please it order book. the book. <laughs> Get the Call book. Sign, you know. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's great. It's, yeah. So anyway, uh, and, and I had to deal with the aftermath of that, maybe through a lot of my career is like you get hooked into this, I got a job and, and it's preparing, it's being in combat and it's preparing guys for combat. That is an all consuming place to be in your life. And ultimately I think it was part of the reason why I, why I finally decided I needed to get away from it. Uh, because it starts to define your life a little bit too much and it becomes a very small world to live in, which a fighter pilot world is a small world to begin with. But when you focus really on this mission, it's the mission kind of thing, it, it, you don't get much personal growth. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in the military have experienced that, especially at high level professional combat units is that, man, you are like immersed in that culture. But in the meantime, you can lose a little bit of your humanity in that too. So, so really, um, it, it got to that point where I was approaching 20 years and I was a squadron commander at Kadena. It was, I didn't get a fighter squadron, which was both surprising and disappointing. And I, I talk about that in the book, uh, but it was actually it turned out to be the best thing for me. I, I became this operation support squadron commander, which was a great job. I loved it. And it gave me opportunity to do things I'd never done before to help people. Um, it was, it was on the sidelines of the mission, but I did, I got to work with great people and help a lot of great people, which I think that's what a commander's job is. Um, but I had a young family still, I saw this air force career that was probably going to be pretty good, but maybe not reach the leadership levels that I wanted to be able to have an impact. 
And, and, and from a personal level, I just go, man, I'm not sure I like the person I am anymore. And I haven't really changed much. I'm a great fighter pilot. I think I'm really good commander. What kind of human being am I? And that was really the impetus for me to go, I, I need to, I need to move on at least the next step. Obviously I'm still connected to the air force and training guys, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was time for me to go. And, and that decision is, it's a very difficult decision, especially for a fighter pilot is when do you hang it up? Um, and, but I made the right decision to do that. So here I am Turn to music. <laughs> what does, what does your wife say? If that's, that's a very personal question. What does she say about the transition of, um, you from that sort of killing machine to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure she was happy about it. Uh, it's really tough to be a spouse, a wife, uh, any spouse, but, uh, you know, traditionally it's a wife, uh, in, in the military, in the officer ranks, in the fighter community. Um, uh, you'd also don't have your own life to live. It's centered around your husband's life and career. And even the community is your, you're, you don't have a big circle of friends and, and realize she was lucky because she spent a lot of time in Okinawa where her family and friends were, uh, in, during my career, she's from Okinawa, she's Japanese, but, um, and that made it tough for her too to be a foreign born spouse that made it even tougher. Um, and, um, she was, she was happy. She told me, she goes, when I was getting out, she goes, I'm never going to any more events. <laughs> work events with you ever again. <laughs> and she's pretty much held true to that. I'm not going, I don't have to, not going to do it. It's like, you're, you're okay, honey. That's all right. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for sticking with me for that, the time you did. Cause she was a trooper, you know, it's a lot of moves, raising kids, having to do stuff that you're not maybe thrilled about. Uh, but there's good people too. So, you know, we've always had good people around us and, and, and that camaraderie is a, is a, is a value, but it can also become a crutch at, at some point. It's really hard for people to get out because the military, you're, everything's decided for you. You know, it's like, what am I, what job I'm going to do next? Where I'm going to go next? Your goals are kind of established for you in a sense. And it's like when you, when you get out and you're suddenly on your own, that safety net is like, so what I, what I always tell guys when they're getting out, it's like, dude, get a hobby. <laughs> you're going to need it or you're going to go crazy because you spend 20 years trying to fix the world, you know, and then the next thing you know, it's like, what do I do now? So, so I took up music, which had always been kind of on the sideline for me, but that, that keeps me motivated now. So you, have you got a YouTube channel? I have a Clouseau music YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll have to. We'll, yeah. we'll put a link to the uh, the the book, most importantly, and your video channel okay. in, in the description of this interview, so people can okay. check it out. But we we were talking yeah. before before we hit record. iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify also. <laughs> okay, send me the links. We'll put the, we'll put them all in the description. So right. but we would we were before I hit record. We were talking, and uh, you said it wasn't a business or anything. It's a hobby. It is a hobby for you. Uh, well, I would like it to be a business, but I like have it. to. Be I would at least have to be successful. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I make a little bit of side money at it music, but it's really hard for musicians to make music nowadays with the, you know, streaming and stuff, unless you really, get, it's a struggle for artists, uh, the way all that works nowadays. It's like, I, you better keep a day job until you make it big. Cause it's, it's really hard for people to make music or make money in the music business. So. Well, if if we can make you a few yen, is it yen? I'll take dollars. Dollars, okay, all right, <laughs> or pounds maybe. Um, we will do. Clutha, thank you very much for your time. It's really a pleasure to speak yeah. to you again, and uh, thanks for sharing your story. Uh, I would, I, I've read your book. I read it years ago, but so I would urge anybody who's watching this interview to go out and, and buy it. Is it going to be available on ebook? Could they get it as an ebook on Amazon? Yeah, I too? think. Uh, I don't know when it's going to come out on ebook, but yeah, it will. So, um, so I, I, this is my first book, so I don't know exactly how they roll that stuff out, but 
if you want the first first edition hard copies, uh, like I said, they're available on Amazon now. And Casemate is Casemate is the pub. Well, let's see, Barnes and Noble, Bookshop.org, uh, <laughs> Ingram, Blake and Taylor. <laughs> so I got that right in front of me here. So um, anyway, it's out there. Uh, you know, yeah, Rita, I think you like it. it's more of a story about life. There's only really a couple chapters dedicated to the war, but but it tells the full story of what takes where your life, how your life moves in a certain direction. Sometimes even these little subliminal things that you think are not important might change the course of your life. And then for me, it kind of ended up over the skies of Iraq and then and then kind of where it led me, my self discovery kind of things of what happened to me after that were they never would have happened if I probably hadn't engaged that Fox pilot. So. I think, uh, I don't know. I think that's where the real um, value in these sorts of conversations is and, and those sorts of books. It's, it's, it's interesting mm-hmm. to talk about individual experiences, but I, I, it's even more interesting to find out how they changed people, how they affected people. Um, mm-hmm. And I think uh, I've had some people on the channel who've had PTS, PTSD um, uh, so Mog Mog Morgan, who was a uh, Sea Harrier pilot, got a couple of kills in in Falklands. He had PTSD after that, and he was he talked about that. That was incredible to hear. And um, I think um, you know, sort of understanding how people deal with the emotions that follow these events. That's you know, yeah, that's interesting. And I talk about that in the book, and uh, and I've never been diagnosed with PTSD, but um, um, I, I just related to uh, that we got this every human has this little dark matter within them within the center of their life and uh, we either feed that or we shine the light on it and and certain events can kind of impact that and it it doesn't have to be a a violent event or committing violence against another human being but it could be anything but but once that little darkness starts to grow uh it's very easy for it to keep growing and and that's where the uh self-awareness needs to come in that's where the healing needs to come in and so i I recommend anybody who and you it's hard to recognize what it is that's causing it but you know if you have anxieties or just don't know what's wrong and you've had a traumatic event in your life is to you know seek seek therapy seek help and 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 work into a program of uh, some level of self-realization um, to where you can dig deeper and, and just see what it is that's going on. And, and that's, that's a, you know, a healthy human life and, uh, and everybody deserves to be, live a happy life. So, so, uh, you know, take care of yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Clusa.